Approaches to speech therapy for stammering can be divided into two broad types, fluency shaping and block modification. Fluency shaping approaches have been around for literally hundreds of years. In contrast, block modification approaches are relatively new. The first forms of block modification therapy were developed in the 1960s by the stammering researcher Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa. The approach was then further developed in the 70s and 80s by two of Johnson's students, Charles Van Riper and Joseph Sheehan. Since then, block modification therapies have become the most commonly used forms of therapy employed by speech therapists to treat stammering in older children and adults. And they're widely used today, especially in Europe and America. In this slideshow, I present a brief outline of the block modification approach and describe how it has evolved since its original formulation. And I explain the motivation behind the development of a new form of block modification therapy, which we have called the JUMP. So what is block modification? Well, essentially, it's an approach to therapy based on the underlying belief that as people who stammer, our biggest problem is not our moments of stammering, but rather some of the unhelpful ways we react to those moments. Specifically, people who stammer tend to react to their moments of stammering with either excessive and inappropriate use of force to get their words out, or excessive avoidance of situations where they fear that they might stammer. And these reactions often cause them a lot more problems than the straightforward repetitions, prolongations and blocks that constitute the primary symptoms of stammering. Block modification therapy is designed to reduce our tendencies to react to our stammering symptoms in these unhelpful ways. The block modification approach is very much in line with the famous observation that Wendell Johnson once made, that stammering is what we do when we try not to stammer. If Johnson's observation is accurate, it follows that if we could somehow stop trying not to stammer, and if instead we could accept the fact that we stammer, then our stammering should reduce and cease to pose so much of a problem to us. To put block modification into context, I want to read an extract from a message from Charles Van Riper, written in 1991 to the National Stuttering Association, in which Van Riper describes how he first came across the idea of block modification while he was hitchhiking. After walking several miles, I sat under a tree to rest near a field where a man was ploughing. Soon, a Model T Ford pulled up beside me and an old man got out to talk with the farmer. I noticed that he had an odd way of speaking, with many little hesitations, but I didn't think it was stuttering. When they finished their conversation, I accosted the old man with a thumb gesture for hitchhiking, and he told me to get in the car. Then, of course, came the inevitable question. What's your name, son, and where are you going? Oh, how I stuttered when I tried to tell him with gasping, facial contortions and body jerks. And then the old bugger started laughing outrageously. I could have killed him. Seeing my anger, he said, take it easy, son, take it easy. I'm not laughing at your stuttering. I've been a stutterer all my life and I used to jump around and make faces just like you do. But I'm too old and tired to fight myself now. So I just let the words leak out and they do. Well, that hit me hard. All my life I'd been trying to talk without stuttering and avoiding it and hiding it whenever I could. And all that had happened was that I had got worse. The old man was telling me that what I should have been seeking was a way of stuttering that would be tolerable, both to others and to myself, that it was possible to stutter so easily and effortlessly that it wouldn't matter, that I could stutter 
and be fluent anyway. This insight that I should learn how to stutter hit me like a bolt of lightning. It wasn't easy unlearning all my struggling and avoiding, but every time I stuttered I had an opportunity to change it to a more fluent form, and so I persisted. At first the gains were small and the failures many, but successes, even partial successes, encouraged me. Moreover, my fears and embarrassments melted away. And now, most of my listeners don't even recognise uh, that I've stuttered when I do. Well, that's the message that I'd like to pass on to my friends of the tangled tongue. Merely accepting one's stuttering is not enough. Speaking out is not enough. Learn how to stutter. Van Riper noted that one of the curious features in the stutterer's perception of his stuttering is his tendency to lump together a host of disparate behaviours, ranging all the way from nose wrinkling to saying ah ah ah, and to call that lump st stuttering or stammering. In fact, the words stuttering or stammering, if you live in England, refer to a wide variety of associated behaviours, some of which are more problematic than others, and some of which are easier to modify than others. And somewhat surprisingly, most people who stammer or stutter are relatively unaware of the specific behaviours that they produce when they do so. Because of this lack of awareness, the first task of block modification therapy is to help clients to identify what exactly it is that they do when they stammer and to help them to recognise which of their stammering behaviours are most harmful to them. It then teaches them to replace those harmful behaviours with behaviours that are less harmful. Block modification therapy also involves a certain amount of cognitive therapy to help clients overcome any feelings of inadequacy or shame related to their stammering and to help them to understand and accept that even if therapy is successful, some aspects of their stammering will probably remain, but that these need not pose a problem. Ultimately, the goal of block modification therapy is to help clients to achieve their optimal potential to communicate verbally. The goal is emphatically not to achieve perfectly fluent speech. To be able to understand how block modification therapy works, it's important to know some details about how stammering tends to change over time. When stammering first starts, most often its symptoms are relatively mild consisting mainly of relaxed repetitions and prolongations of sounds and words. In about 80% of cases, the tendency to produce these relaxed repetitions and prolongations gradually subsides and the stammer disappears. However, the remaining 20% of stammerers become self-conscious of their repetitions and prolongations and start trying to suppress or avoid them. These attempts to suppress or avoid their primary symptoms just make the problem worse and ultimately give rise to the secondary symptoms of stammering, which may then persist into adulthood. I discuss this topic in detail in my slideshows on secondary symptoms, which I strongly recommend you to work through if you've not already done so. Block modification therapies aim to help stammerers whose stammering has become persistent and who have started to produce significant numbers of secondary symptoms. The therapy starts by teaching these stammerers to observe their speech in order to become more consciously aware of the various primary and secondary symptoms that they habitually produce. Having done this, they're then taught to stop themselves producing the unhelpful secondary symptoms and to produce primary symptoms, in other words, relaxed repetitions and prolongations instead. If a client is successful in making these changes, 
The stammering will no longer be characterised by the extreme secondary symptoms. Instead, it will start to resemble the easy form of stammering that is common in young children who have not yet become self-conscious of their disfluencies. To put block modification therapy into context, in the next three slides, I want to fill in a few details about how it first came about and about its three founders, Wendell Johnson, Charles Van Riper and Joseph Sheehan. The block modification approach to therapy was originally developed by the stammering researcher Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa. Johnson's approach was motivated by his observation that although most persistent stammerers know that they stammer, they tend to be surprisingly unaware of what they actually do when they stammer. In light of this observation, Johnson concluded that in order to be able to modify their stammering and make it less problematic, stammerers first need to observe their speech, both their fluent speech and their stammering, so as to become aware both of what they do when they speak fluently as well as what they do when they stammer. So when stammerers came to the Iowa clinic for therapy, they would first be instructed to spend a lot of time simply observing themselves speaking and stammering in as wide a variety of speaking situations as possible. Johnson hoped that as a result of all of this self-observation, the clients would gradually become aware that when they experienced or anticipated difficulty speaking, they could respond in a variety of different ways and that some of these ways of responding are more helpful than others at enabling them to get their message across. Johnson observed that almost invariably, the most helpful ways clients responded to their speaking difficulties were by producing relaxed repetitions of the sounds or words that occurred immediately before the problem words. And Johnson found that all people who stammer produce at least some of these relaxed repetitions from time to time. Having become aware of the ways they respond to their moments of speech difficulty, clients would then be trained to stop producing the responses that were unhelpful and instead to voluntarily produce the relaxed syllable or word re repetitions that were most helpful and to continue making these repetitions until they found that they could move forward and say the words that they feared. Johnson and Associates thus, thus trained their clients to produce these repetitions whenever they anticipated that they were about to have difficulty getting an upcoming word out. This technique came to be known as the Easy Iowa Bounce. In addition to teaching clients the bounce, Johnson and his co-workers made a point of explaining to them how and why the bounce could help them. They pointed out that these easy relaxed repetitions are essentially identical in form to the easy relaxed repetitions that young children spontaneously make at times when they anticipate difficulty saying an upcoming sound or word. And as such, they sound far less abnormal compared to the secondary stammering symptoms that persistent stammerers tend to develop. Moreover, these easy repetitions actually play some useful roles. They help the speaker to hold the listener's attention and they also make it easier for the speaker to get the problem words out, probably because they help him maintain a sense of rhythm while he's trying to speak. Throughout the 1970s, the researcher and therapist Charles Van Riper continued to develop block modification therapy, devising elaborate routines to help clients to identify exactly what they do when they stammer. So as not to overwhelm clients, he instructed them to start first by observing their fluent words, and then to also observe their short, easy stammers, and finally, when they felt ready to do so, to observe their more severe stammers. He also trained clients to identify their avoidance behaviours and the various cues that precipitated their anticipation of stammering. 
Having helped clients to identify all of these things, Van Riper's clinic then trained them how to use three different block modification techniques, cancellations, pullouts, and preparatory sets, all of which have now been adopted by speech therapists around the world. Van Riper also believed that over-reliance on auditory feedback was a major cause of disfluencies in people who stammer. Consequently, in addition to what I've just described, his clinic also trained its clients to change their focus of attention when speaking, so that instead of listening to the sound of their voice, they learned to focus their attention instead on the physical feelings of speaking. The third founder of block modification therapy was Joseph Sheehan. Sheehan was a psychiatrist who specialised in stammering and who had also once been a, a severe stammerer himself. He had studied under both Wendell Johnson and Charles Van Riper and adapted their versions of block modification therapy to, to bring it in line with some of his own beliefs about the nature of stammering. Sheehan developed a theory of stammering that posited that people who stammer, uh, that people stammer when they have two conflicting sources of motivation. On the one hand, they're motivated to speak in order to reap the benefits that verbal communication can bring. But on the other hand, they're motivated to avoid speaking because in the past, some of their attempts to speak have traumatized them in some way or other. He believed that this approach avoidance conflict then results in stammering. To overcome this conflict, Shin suggested that people who stammer should actively seek out the situations that they have tended to avoid, the situations in which they're afraid to speak and afraid to stammer, and to stammer on purpose in those situations, even more so than they would have done had they been trying not to stammer. Sheen also observed that our stammering tends to become more severe when we try to communicate with people who we consider to have a higher status than ourselves. To remedy this, Sheen advocated that stammerers should undergo assertiveness training and that they should learn to stammer in an assertive, non-apologetic way and to stubbornly resist any pressure that they perceive they are under to speak more quickly. Whereas Johnson taught clients to incorporate relaxed syllable and word repetitions, the easy Iowa bounce, into their speech, Sheehan taught stammerers to incorporate relaxed prolongations into their speech, a technique that he called the slide. And he suggested that stammerers should use sliding as a form of voluntary stammering, even in situations where they felt confident that they could speak without stammering. He reasoned that by sliding on purpose, stammerers could transform what had previously constituted av avoidance behaviours into approach behaviours, thus reducing or even eliminating the approach avoidance conflict and the tendency to stammer. To stammer. Many people who stammer have reported that block modification therapy has helped them substantially. Indeed, the 2009 NSA survey that I described in the online course introductory slideshow showed that more people who stammer feel that they've benefited from this approach than from any other approach. However, Despite their excellent track record, these traditional block modification approaches all have some deniable drawbacks. Perhaps their main drawback is that some of the block modification procedures can irritate and elicit negative responses from listeners. This is particularly true of procedures that require the speaker to repeat words that he's already said, despite the fact that the listener has already understood those words. This is most likely to happen during the procedure known as cancellations, 
which requires the speaker to go back and repeat any words or phrases that he stammered on in an uncontrollable way. Although this is rarely a problem in situations where there's little or no time pressure, in the outside world, it, con it can constitute a major drawback as the speaker risks being traumatized by such negative listener responses. And such trauma may actually make the stammering more rather than less severe. A further drawback is that some of the block modification techniques, such as resisting time pressure and ignoring negative listener responses, may only really be possible for stammerers who have a relatively high social status. Children and people with a low social status may find that some of these more assertive block modification procedures are practically impossible to use. And if they do use them, they may be punished or experience social rejection as a result. A few years ago, the Stammering Self-Empowerment Programme developed a new block modification technique called the JUMP that addresses these drawbacks of traditional block modification techniques. Specifically, the JUMP doesn't require the speaker to go back and repeat words or phrases that he's already said. And it doesn't expect the, speech, the speaker to act in a way that may challenge the status of the listener. Consequently, practicing the jump doesn't slow the speaker down. Indeed, it can actually quite substantially speed up his communication rate. Nor does the jump require the speaker to do anything that's likely to elicit negative responses from his listeners. The main difference between the jump and other block modification approaches is that with the jump, you always keep moving forward. You don't waste time continuing to try to say the sounds you got stuck on. Instead, you simply give up on those sounds and carry on with the remaining sounds or words that you want to say. As a result, you say as much of, as possible of what you can say, rather than getting bogged down by the bits that you can't say. In common with the more traditional block modification techniques, the jump does, however, still require you to accept the fact that you stammer to the point where you need to be willing and ready to allow yourself to block freely in front of your conversation partner and not feel ashamed of it or try to hide it. We provide a full explanation of how to use a jump in the slideshows that follow.